welcome back. Another week, another live uh, here at Broadway Music Sessions. I am your host, Geraldine Anello, today with a very, very special guest. We have Rob Michaeler. Hi, Rob. Hi, how are you? Thanks for having me. Oh my goodness, my pleasure. Uh, we are so excited to have you. So for everyone watching this series, as you know, um, it is always for Broadway conductors. And if you know Rob Michaeler, which I'm sure you do, you know that he's an incredible Broadway star. <laughs> and so why should he be here on the series for conductors? So first of all, let me say all the things he's done on Broadway, which is up to seven shows. It is so many Broadway shows. Uh, the lead at Beetlejuice currently quote unquote, uh, pending, uh, pending uh, at Mrs. Doubtfire, uh, Tony Award nominee for Chaplin. Uh, he also did Honeymoon in Vegas, which I saw you in during previews and absolutely loved. I also saw you in Beetlejuice, you're so good. Uh, something Rotten, and um, I love this title you give yourself, uh, which is Professional Make Believer. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> And that takes us straight into the rest of this conversation, which is you're so good at professional make believe that you made 8,600 of us theater music directors believe for sure 100% that you are one of us with your conductor cam videos you started during this pandemic. Oh my gosh. You are one of us. You're, you're a great conductor. <laughs> That's you. I, I literally am just, I'm imitating. I've worked with some really amazing musical directors and conductors in the last 20 years doing this. And um, I've always been fascinated by it. You know, I, when I was a kid, I remember um, the Lion King soundtrack came out. And there's an amazing piece of music in the Lion King movie where uh, the, during this big stampede. And I used to like have a pencil in my bedroom and I would play the Lion King soundtrack and just pretend to be, I just, there's something about the like Mickey Mouse Fantasia shooting fireworks and music from your hands that I've always thought was so cool. I feel like Gandalf from Lord of the Rings when I'm doing it, you know, there's something magical about it. Um, and I, uh, so I've just always really fallen in love with watching my conductors. I watch the conductor monitor. I watch them in rehearsal. I love a sits probe. I love watching them assign where they're going to put the musicians and then remembering and, and watching them figure out how to cue them and okay i've got to hit the click here the whole thing fascinates me so i just um it's, so you became an actor yeah exactly <laughs> <laughs> but i i um i've always been enamored with it and then um when alex brightman and i backstage at beetlejuice used to just joke about some of the funny like eccentricities of conductors like the it started with talking about the sniff cue right <laughs> Right, if you're cueing someone with a sniff, a singer or whatever. If they the can't Broadway play. sniff, the famous Broadway sniff. The famous Broadway sniff. So we were joking about that. And then I said, wouldn't it be funny to see a conductor do like a big, serious preparation and conduct the Hot Pockets commercial song? <laughs> Hot Pocket, that worked. You cued me it. in. Here right. it was. <laughs> so that was the first one. And I just did it as a joke. And then I saw that people really loved it. And I think... I think I'm not alone in being fa being fascinated by conductors, which You're is- You're just talking. You're flattering us now. <laughs> it's true. I'm so in awe of it. It's such a cool art form. <laughs> well, what I think is so cool is that, so you, I, I look back and you started the first one of this series that now has maybe 12 videos, I think, on May 3rd. Today is May 27th. So yeah. you've been quite prolific. Yes. But I think it's so cool that you're doing this during the pandemic because a lot of people are, you know, down and depressed and don't really find the motivation to do things. So what is it that made you go, this is the right time. I'm going to occupy myself by doing this fun project. I knew it would make me laugh and I knew it would make Alex Brightman laugh. And that was kind of it, the first one. Um, so I, just, and, and, you know, I, uh, it, they, I thought I could get it done quickly and it'll make people laugh. And then I started just to see how much people, not only did it make them laugh, but it made them miss going back to work. Right. And, and the, it's in a weird way, the conductor is sort of the center of the universe in a, in whether it be like a, a, um, uh, you know, a concert or a symphony or a musical they're steering the ship right so in a way we like we miss our boss we miss the we miss the people the men and women who are making that all happen and if we can poke fun at ourselves and poke fun at them and poke fun at the audience it, in a way it's like nostalgic for us but until we can get back to doing it for real 
you're making us feel so important. I'm sure I can speak on everybody watching live that we, you are flattering us. We we need, we need the love. We're happy right now. I mean every word of it. <laughs> we miss it. So um, we have some questions here. One from Jose who says, uh, have you uh, had any particular conductor friends contact you uh, who recognize the gesture or look in your videos? <laughs> oh, they all do. Um, the one about, uh, I think it was like maybe the fifth one, which was about cutoffs. <laughs> Um, and then one of the one of the singers doesn't uh, hit the cutoff, uh, <laughs> and uh, and the face I make when I hear the person not uh, hitting the cutoff, I probably twenty five conductors. Not only did they say, "Oh, I think I make that face," but singers they've worked with were saying, "Hey, I've seen you make that face at me." <laughs> <laughs> We're we're aware. We're aware. Yeah. Um, we have, and also the other question is: Did Amtrak ever get back to you after your video? Totally <laughs> <laughs> so understand if that's a source of I, No, I, I can give you a, a little bit. Of <laughs> so I live in Philadelphia, and I commute on the Amtrak train into Ooh. New York, um, which was not great during Beetlejuice, and I had to stop doing it. I actually got an apartment in New York for Mrs. Doubtfire. Um, just because I couldn't risk not being there. Um, but no, Amtrak uh, didn't hold up their end. So I'm I'm gonna, I'll probably go back and forth and uh, spend more time in New York once Mrs. Doubtfire opens up again, unless they can get their act together. But I yes, wish. Yes, Mrs. I, Doubtfire opening. I just love all the times that people talk about when it's gonna open again, because it will happen and it's easy to will. forget. But it I feel will. like it's my job to remind the world. It will happen. You're so well. for everyone watching and you don't know what we're talking about, you can find all of the conductor cams uh, on Rob Michaelers, um Instagram and also on your Twitter, I believe. Yes. And also on your Twitter. They are worth watching. They're just pure pieces of gold. Um, <laughs> and a question here from Kevin. Did you ever have any conducting lessons, even informally, or did you learn everything via observation? You're um, more clear than some people I've worked under. <laughs> I love you. Um, so I, uh, my first professional show was at the Paper Mill Playhouse in 2001. It was a production, a beautiful production of Carousel with an amazing musical director named Tom Helm. And he was the first person that I really sort of z zoned in on. Um, and then um, my first musical on Broadway was Avenue Q. And I got to work with Stephen O'Remus and Gary Adler, who are both wonderful conductors. Incredible. Um, I joke about the Stephen O'Remus Sforzando. Every singer who's ever worked with Stephen O'Remus has to knows about this famous Stephen O'Remus sports. He loves a sportsando. Um, but uh, I, I was just, I, you know, I learned from them and then working with Jason Robert Brown and Tom Murray and James Sampleiner and um, Brian Perry on Chaplin and and uh, Ethan Pop now on Mrs. Doubtfire and Chris Kugel on Beetlejuice, Rob Berman at City the Center. Best of the best. I mean, these guys are just Steve Reinecke with the New York Pops. Just people who I watch and I'm my jaw drops. Um, so in high school, uh, well, well, at my old high school, after my Broadway debut, I actually went back and directed the musical at my old high school for four years. Here it is. You heard it live here. <laughs> you are a conductor. We recognized and, you. And, and I wanted, I, this is totally selfish. I wanted to conduct, we were doing Camelot. And all I thought about was the opening notes of Camelot, which just goes <laughs> three, four. I don't know anyone who doesn't want to give that three four into who who doesn't want to be the person starting that musical that is the most magical thing I can think of so I selfishly said I'm going to conduct and everyone at the school went but you don't conduct and I said I know so I bought I'm not kidding I bought music theory for dummies the orange book music theory for dummies I had no real music theory uh, training before that. And using just that book and all of the conductors that I had worked with prior to that, I conducted Camelot at my old high school. And I know that those musicians probably put up with a lot of inaccurate conducting, but it was the beginning of, of, uh, uh, of what is promising to be a, a brilliant secondary career for you, for sure. I mean, here we are where there's, we, you know, you're getting the most recommendations ever. There's like 8,600 of us music directors and we're all saying, yes, Rob well, Michler is a conductor. So I, I want all those compliments to just reflect on this mirror and hit all of you. because. <laughs> Well, if only we could act as well as you conduct. <laughs> I know I can't. Here's a question from Brayden. Uh, Brayden says, I know in this group that people, all the conductors, have commented that you conduct very clearly. Would you ever conduct an orchestra? I would. Are you kidding? That's like my dream. I mean, I, 
I watch, I, I, I do, I go on YouTube and I watch everyone from, from John Williams to Bobby McFerrin to just these people who have all of these wildly different styles. Um, and, and the one, you know, I love, no, I love nothing more than, you know, I had a friend just the other day who said to me, you know, I was watching your conductor videos and I was thinking, can you explain to me why all of those musicians know what they're playing? There's the notes there. Why do they even need a conductor? And I loved answering that for someone who really doesn't know, right? To people who don't know, they don't get why you're waving your arms around. But to say to him, okay, you and your son start singing happy birthday right now. And they go and you you didn't start together. Why didn't you start together? Because you don't have one person telling you when to begin. Imagine now you've got a symphonic orchestra. You all need someone steering the ship. And he goes, oh, I never thought of that before. And then, I, <laughs> you know, and imagine if you've got, you know, someone who's tasseting for 164 bars, they need a little help knowing <laughs> when, it's, when it's them. Um, I just love it. And dynamics and uh, all of the nuances of it. It's just my favorite <laughs> thing ever. Kimberly says you should write conducting for dummies. Oh <laughs> so God. there you go. I would love it. If you need testimonials, we're ready for you. Uh, Alexander wants to know what would be your dream show to conduct? Oh, Sweeney Todd. Sweeney Todd. I think <laughs> I, I think that score is among the the best, most you know masterful masterpieces ever ever written. Sweeney, uh, I think West Side Story would be the hardest thing ever because of all of the crazy time signature changes. I I don't uh, that would require me to put in an amount of work that I right now I'm faking it. That would require me to not fake it. <laughs> I mean, what would that look like for you? What's the difference between faking it and not faking it? Um. Me going like, oh, there's a seven eight bar back into a four four section. How do you really do that? Because right now I'm going like, oh, I'm in four, I'm in three, I'm in six eight. Should I conduct it in three? Should I can if it's in three four? Should I conduct it in one? But once we get into the really nitty gritty stuff, I I'd have to look it up. I'd be pretending. I don't have any. Of any of that knowledge you are one of us you talk like us <laughs> uh, i think something but that's interesting here you talk about all these incredible music directors you've worked with it's clear that uh, as an actor you really are in the best spot if you have an interest in conducting to actually watch like as a broad actor watching like the best of the field Absolutely. i remember tom murray tom murray on on uh, honeymoon in vegas who is just one of the loveliest tom murray is not a particularly theatrical person but he is the one of the most musical geniuses I've ever worked with. And there were times in that show where it was more important to him to get the feel right than to be clearly conducting. So there were moments in that show where he would just start dancing. I remember there was a, there's a, um, there's a song at the end of act one called do something. And uh, I would sing, I'll do anything to get her back. And on the downbeat of back, the orchestra would sing this crazy sort of like marimba um, uh, to get her la 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 and Tom Murray would go to get her la 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 now is that conducting yeah because every one of those people in that big 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 band knew exactly what he meant right um and i i went there's a non theatrical person who has the music so inside of them that the clearest way for him to translate that to the orchestra is to dance how how cool an art form is that it's so cool and honeymoon in vegas was awesome i mean gee, i had such a great time at that show i loved it it was so happy and that my music was band. great that on stage band holy cow and that on stage band we have a question from someone now i'm sorry person i don't see your name over here just say it's facebook user but the question is what are traits you love about your favorite musical directors um when it when story is infusing their musicality you know what i mean when it's clear that they are breathing with a performance and that's what's driving the musicality. Not so, you know, the the to stay true to the score is obviously the most important thing, right? To the original composer's intention, but but then to to allow there to be live communication with the actor so that they're really in our heads, so that they can breathe with me, or they can, you know, it it the 
the whatever's happening on stage is infusing the drama with which they translate it to their musicians. And then everyone is on the same page because those musicians don't, they can know the show. They can know that, but from night to night, eight shows a week, they don't know the nuances of what's happening above and behind them. So having a musical director who can dramatically influence them as a mirror, literally from me to him or her to the musicians, is, is that, I mean, that's what I really, when, when, when I feel that relationship is when I really feel like we're soaring together. It's really cool. Hearing you talking about this actually makes me think of this question, you being a conductor and an actor, how do you feel about those uh, pits that are not at all near the actors, that are completely remote? I mean, it's not ideal, obviously it's not ideal because we love, we love to be, for two reasons it's not ideal. One is just because, um, there's nothing like that live room, right? When we all, like when we record an album and we all go into the studio together and you, the sound is swirling around you from the trombone, not from the trombone to the microphone through the speakers to me. Um, but uh, I understand, you know, I understand the constraint and I'd rather them find places for a larger orchestra outside of the pit than cut members of the orchestra. So do that, um, oh. that's what it takes. But, but the, um, but, what I will say is like the conductor monitor, which is what I'm paying loving tribute to with the conductor camp, is what is linking all of us, right? Is that that person, the person on that screen is the translator from all of those different places. So um, as long as as long as they have that form of communication, it seems to seems to work out. We have a question here from Alexander who wants to know if there is a video you wish you could make, but that you haven't been able to yet. Oh, well, there's so many that are, that I have, I'm restrained by the fact that I'm alone in, uh, in my house with a little black backdrop. Um, there are so many things I would do, like the fog for Phantom of the Opera, that one. I had to, I had to figure out green screen smoke because I don't have a fog machine in my house. <laughs> <laughs> um, I actually, here's what's funny. That fog, I found a video online of a person shooting clouds outside of the window on a plane going by and I turned it this way and that's what the fog is. <laughs> um, but there are lots of there are lots of things that I wish I could uh, demonstrate in the pit dealing with an audience. You know, one of the first things I thought was, wouldn't it be lovely if I had the orchestra pit here so you can see those annoying people who always sit front row center and tend to fall asleep? <laughs> it's so much money to be right here. And it's always like the the 94 year old uh, guy who, who spent $180 on a nap. Uh, and we always have to ignore that person. <laughs> we might or might not take screenshots of those and oh, yeah. have a running collection. <laughs> All of those people who have fallen asleep during a show, we have photos of you. <laughs> we know who you are. <laughs> and before the cam is over, I will make one about people sleeping on the conductor monitor. I, I'm promising it now. <laughs> we have a question from Rendon who wants to know what has been your favorite conductor cam to film so far? Um, that's hard. Um, the one about um, Billy Bigelow singing the alternate note in If I Loved You. Oh, what, woo, what? that one hurt. <laughs> it hurt. <laughs> because for two reasons. One is that's Anthony Warlow, who is an Australian musical theater superstar who I have admired since I was 14. So one, it's on his album. It's his where I think, you know, if it's your album, go for it. In the context of the show, I think we all would be like, hey, that's Rogers and Hammerstein. Why are you messing around with Rogers and Hammerstein? But um, I just love the idea of like, because I've seen it happen when a conductor learns that their principal actor has friends in the audience by the vocal choice they make that day. It's, like, it's what, true. What was that? And then all of a sudden, because what normally happens is they do that, they hit this alternate note, they surprise everyone, what the hell was that? Then after the show, you go on stage as you're leaving the theater and they have 14 people they're giving a backstage tour to and you go, mm -hmm. interesting. <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> I had a great musical director, uh, a guy named Ken Clifton, who works a lot down in Florida, now moved back to New York. He's a great, great musical director, great conductor. 
And uh, I actually, um, I wrote a, a musical about working at a bagel. I, I baked bagels in high school at four o'clock in the morning. That was my part-time job. And I wrote a musical called The Bagel Factory about working in a bagel store. <laughs> and very graciously, musically directed and conducted that musical when we did it at my old high school. And a kid sang an alternate note in rehearsal. And my friend Ken said, hey, Rob knew that that note existed and he picked this one. <laughs> and I was like, I love that. So now, you know, if I hear that, I go, you know, Roger and Hammerstein knew that note existed, but they picked this one. <laughs> Conducting advice for all of us on how to handle singers. Love it. A uh, question from Alexander. What's uh, your favorite musical moment in a show that you've done, uh, either between you and the music director or just in general? Oh, that's a good one. Uh, I would love to know about you and a conductor. Did you have like a moment? Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm sure we have lots of them. Um, there, there are lots of, of things on stage where I get, you know, there's, there's wonderful moments where we cheat to get the conductor in our periphery, right? There's this wonderful test of like, oh, my instinct wants to play out here, but I have to get that cue. Do I cheat to the monitor on the mezzanine? Do I cheat to them? Do I cheat? I love figuring out how to get my gaze where it needs to be to get what I need to get from them. Um, but most of the time, a lot of my work that I love with a conductor is in rehearsal. Um, you know, days where Tom Murray, Honeymoon in Vegas, I had a song called Isn't That Enough in Act Two. And I dramatically wanted, there's sort of a, a high note in the first verse that I wanted to float in my falsetto. And then I thought in the last verse, I should belt that note because I flipped it the first time. It's getting more dramatic in the second time. Oh, then I'll do it in my chest voice for the second time. And I got sick in the first like two weeks of previews. And Tom Murray came into my dressing room and he just said, hey, do you want to float it twice until you feel better? And I said, oh, can I do that? He said, of course you can do that. I said, really? He said, yeah, a, a song is like a suit. It's it's beautifully made, but it has to be tailored to the person wearing it. Oh. So at this time, we need to tailor this suit to you. And that night when I went to sing that second verse and I got to a place where I normally belt and I flipped it, he guided the orchestra dynamically to support the choice of flipping it. And you, that's the type of relationship that I, you can't you can't understand how grateful an actor is for it and until you're there and you go, oh my gosh, to be lifting me up with this bed of an orchestra is so thrilling. And that, that was getting back to your other question. I wanted to add when you said, you know, musicians playing in other rooms. The other thing I hate about that is when the orchestra and the actors tend to either use a different exit or entrance or get to the theater at different times because we never see each other. I've done Broadway shows where I've like never met the clarinet player and I have to actively seek them out because we don't enter or exit the building at the same time and we are never in the same place of the building. So making the effort to go find each other is another thing that I encourage um, actors to do because you, they're, they're just as vital to the performance as anybody else. Because you are a conductor, that's why you are one of us. I'm, I'm sticking to this. Um, uh, here's a fun question. What's the oddest outfit or prop that you've seen from a music director on a conductor cam? Oh my gosh. Well, in Beetlejuice, Chris Kukul is constantly having to navigate props being thrown around him. There, Beetlejuice is constantly having you know a, a microphone with a giant arm go past his head and hand Beetlejuice the microphone. And then Beetlejuice breaks a ukulele and two pieces of the ukulele fall past him. And then he's got to throw up another ukulele. To Sometimes conductors are asked to participate above and beyond <laughs> what they should be doing. And that was what I was trying to do with that Joseph and the Amazing Technicolor Dreamcoat video was uh, I, I jokingly called it joining equity because at some point conductors <laughs> end up performing so much uh, in ways that the audience can see and appreciate that they uh, they end up, they really should be having a uh, an equity contract because they're up there with us. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the, that reminds me of a couple of moments. I mean, Julie McBride did such an incredible job doing a lot of that stuff at SpongeBob on Broadway. Oh she goodness. was music directing and she had those little puppets and she had a yes. whole scene of puppetry. I'm, I'm <laughs> and, telling you. 
she would turn around and she would have the glasses and she just had so many, I mean, a lot of people who don't think of conductors in the audience actually really took note of her because she was just so incredible in that role. Well, and that's the thing, I, I, you know, for, you know, it's becoming more and more popular that shows are getting less stick conducted and more key one head conducting. Oh, that was one of my favorite video of yours. Mm -hmm. That oh, runaway <laughs> headphones. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, the other reason why I don't always love that, I understand the budgetary concerns and you go like, hey, if it's not, you know, if it's a pop show or something that can be conducted from the keys, you can save a contract. I get it. But the problem is that a lot of times I think the audience, if they don't see the guy with the stick, they almost forget that the orchestra is there. You know, they, they, there's something about the, the, the man or woman standing there in, the, in a light that reminds them that the sound coming through the speakers is coming from human beings. Mm -hmm. Um, I, and I just, I so love that. So if you can get the keyboard one person's head with headphones to break the orchestra pit enough to see the head, then I'm all for it. Yeah. But that's how it was at Kinky Boots. And that was fun. Yeah. And <laughs> it's the best seat in the house. That's right. That's right. <laughs> A question from Brayden. When you're on stage, do you prefer seeing stick conductors or piano conductors? Uh, stick. I just feel like they can, uh, they have one less thing to do, right? A very complicated thing less to do. So they can be, you know, I remember um, on the Something Rotten tour, uh, Something Rotten on Broadway, um, we had the amazing Phil Reno conducting us every night. And um, he has those, you know, we would get to the, the song, It's a Musical, which has about 45 tempo changes in it. And it's all about tribute moments to great moments in musical theater history. So you've got the kick line from Hello, Dolly. You've got, um, you know, hey, big spender, right into rent, right into Avenue Q, right into. So he had him having all of those references inside him to stick conduct those parody moments. He could really feel those tempo shifts. When someone's got to play it and do it at the same time, I feel like the responsibility to multitask sometimes can take away from the opportunity mm -hmm. to be uh, more focused on dynamics and connection with the performer because you're just, you know, to, to say like, hey, all of those things you do conducting and musically directing, can you do them while playing the piano one part? It's, of course the conducting is going to suffer um, because now you're playing piano one. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, I, again, I understand it. I understand why they do it. Um, I just wish we were, we had the luxury of always having someone with a stick. And I like to think of it right now, we have, uh, there's one show happening in Seoul, Korea, which has been extended. So the world is already happening and we have current shows in the world. Um, but you are, I believe, the currently most watched conductor in the world because I saw your views and it's between 19 and 28,000 viewers. And again, they've come out less than a month ago. So this, the number is about to, to go up and up, but people are into conductors, aren't they? They are, and and um, another one, another legendary musical director is Alex Lacamoire, obviously, who did Hamilton and Dear Evan Hansen. And he's just unbelievable. And so when he and Lin Manuel Miranda got got wind of the videos, and I did um, I did one to Waving Through a Window, yes. and I called it Catching the Spirit, which is the moment when the conductor, I mean, the music gets inside of them and they can't help themselves, right? Um, and Alex is one of those prodigies who just that. That, you know, when I say I feel like music shoots out of the conductor, he's one of those people who you look down and you go like, yeah, that's that sound is shooting out of that guy's hands. You know what I mean? Um, so when they caught wind of it and they shared it, then I knew I was <laughs> in trouble because, you know, it was a, a lot of people tuning in. I have to say, you were the first conductor I've ever seen actually stick their tongue out in such a rock and roll way. <laughs> that, that is more of a guitarist move. Well, a conductor. <laughs> what's so funny is that a lot of musical directors actually wrote me because they, a lot of conductors are also the MD, but they also have a lot of training in voice, whether or not they've collaborated with voice teachers or voice coaches, or they have the training themselves. And they're constantly talking about getting your tongue out of the way, right? Get your tongue out of the way of the tone. Get your tongue out of the way of the tone. So a lot of times if you're an offstage singer for clarity or tone or shift, they'll have you do ridiculous things like that. Mm -hmm. I remember Stephen O'Remus on Avenue Q. There was the opening song from Avenue Q, which is the children's television theme, which starts with do-do-do, ba-do-ba, do-do-do, ba-do-ba, wow. And he would, first of all, he would kill me that I didn't do the sports ondos. Do 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 ba do ba. Sports ondos everywhere. He needs them. Thank you. 
But he also said, A, no, no vibrato. It's children's television, no vibrato anywhere. But he would, he would yell at us and say, I can hear whether or not you're smiling. It makes, it, it makes a difference. So he made us stand in a circle around a microphone rather than pick up our individual mics. He put a group mic backstage, made us sit, stand in a circle and sway so that we would sing, the sun is shining, it's a lovely day. And he would look in the monitor and be going, the sun is shining. <laughs> so things like sticking out your tongue and smiling and ridiculous expressions to the conductor cam monitor happens all the time. You guys know. <laughs> it's so fun. Um, I want to talk about something that I heard about before I knew was really cool, but now talking with you and understanding your background as both an actor and a conductor makes even more sense, which is your app, Harmony Helper. Yeah. yeah Can so you tell us about it? Yeah, I had a student, this kid uh, named Andrew Goring. He was 15 years old, and he could not hold Harmony to save his life. Oh. He, he would learn it, and he would sing it back to me. But the second he heard the melody or someone else singing a different harmony, he would resort back to the melody or sing the harmony along with the person next to him. He couldn't hold it. So we started talking about how to drill it. And he said, well, I know I need someone to sing the other parts, but I, I want to be able to practice by myself. The, the thing I have trouble with is that when I practice by myself, I have it. And then when other people, and I don't want to make other people sing with me for me to be able to develop an ear to hold, how, how can I do this? So we partnered and developed this app called Harmony Helper, which basically separates out all of your parts, uh, separates out the piano accompaniment so that you can hear separately the melody, all the harmony parts and the piano accompaniment. But then we hit the concern with, well, how do you get your music into the app? Is it library based? Then we have copyright issues. How do we get our music in there to be able to then separate it out? So we developed this technology where you can take a picture with your phone and it will convert the audio to MIDI which then, you can, which then you can separate out your vocal part and your harmony. Now, as someone who loves and appreciates conductors and music directors, it's never going to replace the musical direction of someone sitting there and helping you with your part. But what it will replace is hopefully the annoying moment in rehearsal that every musical director has experienced where the clock hits six o'clock and 12 performers line up at the piano going, I didn't get a clean pass of my alto <laughs> line. Can you just plunk out the entire, it's going to eliminate that part. You so, are one of us. <laughs> so, <laughs> so that you could skip to the actual making of music. You can skip plunking and hopefully get to the actual dynamics and cutoffs and musicality that you want to be doing in music. Right? You want to skip the plunking part. So the idea is that hopefully, um, People can use this to put their sheet music in and learn their parts, but also we're, we're now developing group sharing. So the idea is that the MD can load the PDF score right into the app, separate out the parts for you before you start, and two weeks before you start rehearsal at a community theater or a high school or a church, email it out and say, hey, your parts are in there. Learn them so on day one, we can get a head start. Uh, so hopefully it's not just a tool for actors, but a tool for MDs too. Be a conductor, don't be a plunker. <laughs> yeah, exactly. exactly. <laughs> Here we are. Well, Rob, it's such a pleasure having you. Uh, uh, Rob, what am I thinking? Maestro, <laughs> such a pleasure having you with us today. Thank you for making us feel important. Thank you for giving us some joy and rem remind ourselves how much we love the theater in this time. Mm -hmm. Uh, thank you for being so wonderful, sharing your generosity, like somebody just wrote. I, um, it's impossible not to love this man. Uh -huh. And indeed, you are very loved here at Theater Music Directors. Well, I mean every word. I, I'm in awe of what you guys do. And I can't wait to get back to the theater so that I can work with more of you because they, it really, you're my favorite people. It's so cool. Thank you so much. Thank you, Rob. Everybody, thank you for watching live. We're back tomorrow, 4 p.m. with West End Music Director Extraordinaire, Mike Dixon. Thanks, Rob. Bye. Bye.